guest is Christina Stevenson. Christina's here, I think. Hi. Hi. Christina is a candidate to be Oregon's next labor commissioner. Welcome, Christina, and thank you for being here. Last time you were here, uh, you were running in the primary, and now you've won that and you're looking to November. Um, tell us about your candidacy and talk about a bit about what the labor commissioner does and why this position is so important. Why should voters care about this race? Okay, thank you, Laura, and thanks everyone for being here tonight. You heard my name is Christina Stevenson and I'm running for labor commissioner. So the first, the, the million dollar question that everyone always wants to know is what on earth does the labor commissioner do? And so the labor commissioner oversees the Bureau of Labor and Industries, and some people know it as BOLI. And the four principal duties of BOLI are to protect the civil rights of Oregonians in the workplace, in public spaces, and in housing, to enforce compliance with wage and hour laws. So that's your meal break, your rest break, overtime, prevailing wage, to help train employers to understand and comply with those laws and then to promote the development of a highly skilled and competitive workforce in Oregon through the apprenticeship programs. So those are the main pieces at play at Bowley. And just a little bit about me, you know, I was born and raised here in Oregon. And, you know, I've seen a lot of ups and downs, but I'm running for labor commissioner because I actually fundamentally believe that Oregon should be the best place to live and work in this country. And so my day job is mostly representing workers, you know, workers who are getting a raw deal when their employers are not following the rules enshrined by the Bureau of Labor and Industries. So that's rules like paying workers all their wages, not discriminating against workers on the basis of their race or their gender. Rules like not retaliating against employees when they raise safety issues. And, you know, my tiny law firm, gone toe to toe with some of Wall Street's biggest banks and their armies of lawyers. Uh, we did so on behalf of an employee that was fired for blowing the whistle on fraud at Wells Fargo. We beat them in court. You know, I'm damn proud of that. But I know that there are still so many employees that don't even know their rights. They don't know the help that they could receive from Bully. And I also own and operate a business. You know, a business I started at the kitchen table when my son was just three months old. I know what it's like to run payroll every month, including during a global pandemic. Uh, I've always run a business where I pay my employees well before I pay myself. You know, my staff know that I'm looking out for them, that they're safe, they're protected, they're fairly compensated. Uh, but again, I know that many employers don't know their responsibilities. And they don't even know the help they can receive from Bully. So I really believe that we can create the type of Oregon that we want. And Bully is a huge part of that. Thank you. So as you as you mentioned, Bully is the agency that administers Oregon's discrimination laws. Um, could you talk about your role in that? And you you've touched on your experience. Tell us more about that and the priorities that you have to build on and enforce um, those protections? Well, so to, to, to kind of give you a, a little sense of how much time I spent with Bully, I mean, I've had Bully on speed dial for over a decade here. So I've spent tens of thousands of hours with the law that is enforced by this agency. And that's on behalf of, you know, employers helping them comply with the law. And then on behalf of, of workers who've been discriminated against, you know, I've also done work in public accommodations as well. And the other the other thing that I do in just my free time and kind of for fun is you know, I go down to Salem and help draft and pass things like Oregon's paid family medical leave insurance and the Oregon Workplace Fairness Act. So these are laws that uh, that also touch on bully. So for example, we know that any right, you can have any law that you want. But if it's not enforced, it is completely meaningless. So for example, with paid family medical leave insurance, you know, the data is all there about how important this is, you know, nursing mothers, you know, folks that, that need to take time off to care for, for themselves or a family member who's going through cancer. You know, we know these are things that we care about as Oregonians. We want to enable this, right? 
but if if an employer it you know violates that law and it is not held accountable then it's completely meaningless right it's meaningless for people to have these rights if they can be retaliated against or discriminated against for using those rights so that's where bully comes in is in the anti-retaliation provisions and then the Oregon Workplace Fairness Act, this is a landmark act in, in Oregon, and it is aimed at rooting out discrimination in our workplaces. So, and discrimination based on race, sexual orientation, um, and, and more. So it's, these are the pieces to the puzzle to kind of create the workplaces that we want in our state. Uh, I and I don't think that there there should be much uh, debate about it. You know, we all want safe workplaces where where you could just go to work and do your, do your job and and that be the end of it. Uh, you know, I should add equal pay to that list. Another uh, law that I worked on that that we got passed. Just real simple stuff. You know, getting paid for your work to uh, no matter your race or your gender. Thank you. Are, are there particular issues related to enforcement of these laws that you intend to focus on? Well, when it comes to enforcement, I, I just got to kind of give you the, the context of Boley. So Boley's got about half the folks that it had 40 years ago. So, and obviously you all know Oregon's only gotten bigger, right? We've got 500,000 businesses in this state. We have you know, investigators who had, you know, 100 cases. So in in order for us to actually enforce the law, we have to be effective with our resources. And so that's why I'm, I'm really interested in us investing in, in a model, it's called strategic enforcement. So it's just, it's just getting started at the agency, but it contemplates the situation we have, which is that there's limited resources, right? So how do we do with what we have? How do we, how are we most effective? And there, there's a number of pieces to this puzzle, but the, you know, the, the main thing is that we use our resources to the highest effect. So, you know, repeat offenders, people where we have data, this, the agency has years of data, you know, of where the, the problem spots are, and if we can use our resources to go after the the bad actors, the known bad actors or repeat offenders in these particular industries, we can have actually an industry-wide effect uh, by actually demonstrating that we do care about enforcing these laws. So that's that's a little piece of the puzzle, but it's it's being strategic with our scarce resources. Thank you. This is a question in the chat. Um, what role do the unions have in bullies enforcement of wage and hour and discrimination laws and the training and apprenticeship programs and what changes would you like to see uh, in the role that unions have? So a lot of folks that, you know, maybe if they're in a unionized workplace, you know, they'll have a collective bargaining agreement that, that, you know, perhaps has some ideas about how conflicts should be, um, approached. And what I would say is bully is, is separate and apart from that. So just because someone is covered under collective bargaining agreement doesn't mean they can't also utilize the agency. You know, it is always a right. A, a lot of, you, know, you may see companies from time to time trying to, you know, get, get people to sign a contract saying, you know, I'm not going to go to bully. Uh, can't do that. You can always have the right to go and talk to a government agency that enforces the laws and, you know, including bully. So I, I think it's a, another place that adds protection for non-represented and, and represented workers alike. Uh, unions have uh, a great history in terms of the apprenticeship programs. You know, a lot of our tried and true apprenticeship programs in the building trades, you know, we think of, we think of unions, we think of the, that, you know, this beautiful pathway where you earn while you learn and you don't come out with a ton of debt and you're making, you know, a hundred thousand bucks or, or more in some of these, um, in, in some of these professions. And I think about, you know, growing up in, in, in a more rural part of Washington County, uh, I know that this would have been life-changing pathway if, if it had even been talked about in my high school, right? 
And so I think that that is a role that need, that bully needs to start bridging is is bridging that K-12 gap so that that people even know about this, that they know about pre-apprenticeship programs to get our 16, 17 year olds with the skills they need to go seamlessly into apprenticeship programs so that when they graduate from high school, they don't have to take extra classes in order to get into apprenticeship programs. So that is a piece that I want us to invest in and, and build on on the, the great work that our uh, apprenticeships have, have given us so far. Thank you. We have another question in the chat about childcare. Um, in, in what way does your office uh, get involved with that? Yeah, that's a great question. So one of the things that, you know, we were just talking about apprenticeships, right? We think of those mostly in the building trades, but now they're starting to be expanded to other areas, you know, other areas like healthcare. And, and one of them is actually childcare. Uh, so there's a, uh, on the on the coast, there's a child care apprenticeship program that's just getting started, which is going to be delivering high quality uh, child care and early learning, and actually, you know, providing those those workers with a, a family wage job. So it is the best of all worlds, and hopefully, is a little piece of the puzzle to uh, our child care crisis because. You know, as someone who, who went through that myself, you know, it's basically a mortgage payment for these, uh, you know, to send a child to, to child care, right? And that's just deeply, deeply unaffordable. And it's inequitable, right? We, we saw how many people are, are excluded from the workforce, you know, because of this, because it's completely unaffordable to, to have your, your kids um, in child care. Thank you. Um, what ways do you see that Bully could improve access by employees to information and assistance to benefits and for hearings? Yeah, gosh, you know, so right now, if you uh, are an employer and you call it Bully and you ask for advice, you'll, you'll get it. Um, I mean, there's already, there's not enough people to give that advice, but at least you'll get it. You know, you'll get it eventually. If you're an employee and you call it bully, you've got one route, which is, are you gonna file a complaint or not? There isn't a kind of question and answer sort of service. And that's a huge miss for us, right? Because we could be able to provide people with, uh, you know, something maybe that's less escalated than a complaint, right? <laughs> if we just provide some information, maybe we don't even get to a complaint. Maybe we can even get, uh, you know, just pick up the phone and, and let someone know, oh yeah, actually, you know, you do have to pay for sick time. You know, really simple stuff. Uh, but if you go on Bully's website, it, it is better. It, I will tell you it is better than it has been in the past, but it's still incredibly dense legalese. Right, and, and that's not accessible for employees, it's not accessible for employers. So I would love us to build to a place where there is a technical assistance for employees. You know, just that same, just the same service, just someone calls, am I reading this right? Are these my rights? And also sort of, you know, a kind of a rapid response where, you know, if, if I'm trying to take lead right now, um, because you know someone I love just passed away, and my employer has you know a ten-year-old uh, employee handbook that says bereavement leave isn't protected in Oregon. I want to be able to to tell them right away. No, you cannot. You know you need to update your handbook because you cannot terminate someone because uh, their their person just passed away. Right? I think that we can solve at least a subset of the problems by having that avenue open. Thank you. Um, we've had some questions about, or, and you talked about Oregon's training and apprenticeship programs um, and building on those. It, what role does Bully have in bringing new jobs to Oregon? Well, so one of the things that the legislature did was pass the Future Ready Oregon package. And one of the things in that package was uh, a little under $20 million for Bowley to administer a grants program to develop pre-apprenticeship programs in construction and healthcare 
to manufacturing and develop apprenticeship programs in healthcare and manufacturing. So those are, and, and those, uh, those grants are targeted to historically marginalized communities. Yeah, those are priority populations for those grants to, to sort of redress some uh, the, the past harms that, you know, committed in, in Oregon and the United States. So those, that money though is, it is to build the, the workforce that we need. We know that there, there are some innovative models coming together for example, example, you know, AFSCME has a, a uh, behavioral health apprenticeship that they're developing. You know, SEIU has a, a home health care CNA apprenticeship program they're developing, right? But when you're starting in uh, 2022, as opposed to a couple hundred years ago, you you need a little bit extra support. And I think that's what the, you know, future ready dollars are for is to help people develop these pathways that, that are just starting there and will need just a little bit of nurturing before they can become the sort of sustainable pathways that we need. We had one more question in the chat um, along those lines with the future increase in need for IRS agents. Uh, would it make sense to create an apprenticeship for tax accountants and that kind of thing? Ooh, I love it. Uh, would love us to be able to recover those tax dollars uh, for all the all the great programs that we want. So I, I'm up for it. Let's let's talk. Well, Brett is full of good ideas uh, uh, tonight. Thank you, Brett, for that question. Um, so, Christina, how can we as activists here at Coin? How can we help you get elected? Well, gosh, I love that question and appreciate it. And <laughs> thank you all for, you know, I mean, just learning about the office, you know, you all are probably the people in your community, you know, where your neighbor says, gosh, who sh you know, who should I vote for, right? Because they know that you pay attention and that you care. So being able to just educate people and, and spread the word, it's incredible how much just the, the, the person to person activism is. I mean, that is how we uh, that that is how we compete with people with just you know nothing but money, right? Is just people power. It, it's getting out the message. This does make a difference. And one of the things you know you asked early on, you know, well, why should people care about this race? I I mean, one thing that we didn't talk about. It's, it's a little wonky, but I know you all can handle it. Um, so Bully has a quasi judicial role. So that means it acts a little bit like a court. And so there are cases that, that you may have heard about in the past, but you know, they come through a bully and a question is asked, was this discrimination or was it not? And the final person to answer that question, is this discrimination or is it not, is the commissioner. And in the context of a very conservative US Supreme Court, we have I mean, you, you read the opinions, we have got to thread the needle in order to make sure that we keep our rights here in Oregon. Because if we do it wrong, Supreme Court is going to say no. Okay, so we have, you know, we cannot have an asterisk to people's rights in Oregon. It, you either, you cannot discriminate here based on people's sexual orientation, gender identity, uh, but we, those things are uh, are threatened by the Supreme Court. And so it does make a difference who is going to stand up for non-discrimination in the state. Thank you so much. Um, we have your uh, uh, campaign website and we'll put that in the link in the chat. Um, Brett also asked if you have any swag or uh, signs, buttons, anything like that available. We do, we have, we have buttons, we have uh, lawn signs. Right now at the, the Beaverton Democratic Party of Oregon office, but there'll be a, a other ones as well, um, some stickers, yeah. Okay, so check in with the local Dems offices uh, for that information. Um, do you have any social media uh, that we could help with? Yes, great, we're on Facebook and Instagram. A tiny bit on Twitter. 
Okay. This place is scary. Okay, great. If you could provide us with those uh, links or we'll find them and, and pass them along to our members, that would be great. Thank you so much, Christina, for joining us tonight. We really appreciate yeah. your time. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a good night.